Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first webinar of 2021. My name is Victoria, and I'm a Senior Business Development Coordinator at 2H Offshore. We started this webinar series last year in April during COVID lockdown and held a live webinar every two weeks in 2020. Going forward, we'll be hosting these events once a month, so we hope you will continue to join us and find the information useful. Today, our webinar is entitled Cost Optimization Strategies for Offshore Fixed Wind Foundations. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few important housekeeping items. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you soon, so please look out for a link to that in your email. Secondly, if you have technical or content-related questions today, please feel free to ask them at any time. You can use the Q&A box that is located on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through as many questions as we can. But if you have further questions, feel free to contact our speaker directly after the presentation. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Srinath Natarajan. Srinath is currently a global director at 2H in Kuala Lumpur. He has over 17 years of specialist experience in min minimum facility platforms, novel installation methods, deep water riser engineering, naval architecture, marine hydrodynamics, subsea monitoring, and integrity management of subsea systems. Shuri is responsible for delivering several turnkey minimum facility platforms and deep water rises system delivery as a project manager slash sponsor, ensuring technical, commercial, and contracts management from concept to installation. So with that, I'm gonna pass things over to Shuri to get us started today. Thank you, Victoria, for the warm introduction. I'm really glad to be here today talking on this uh, topic of interest and I hope you all find this information very useful. I'll begin with uh, giving an overview of the fixed wind turbine foundation design. Uh, uh, the growing trend in the market is to use larger wind turbine generator capacities, 10 to 15 megawatt capacities and in much deeper water depths. So that really poses a unique design challenge uh, when it comes to extrapolating these conventional fixed offshore wind turbine foundations into those larger turbine capacities and deeper water depths. So I'll specifically talk on the challenges associated with that. And after that, I'll also present on some of the cost optimization strategies. Um, firstly, it's about utilizing pre-installation of uh, the piles for these fixed offshore wind turbine foundations. These have been successfully uh, been deployed in uh, several wind farm foundations uh, all across the world. And I will also touch upon uh, using group pile concept, which has a lot of uh, track record in the oil and gas industry space on larger, bigger platform payloads. So we could draw parallels from that and we could present on that, how that could be used for these 10, 15 megawatt wind turbine foundations. I'll also talk about uh, utilizing some of the proven technology around uh, using monopod combined with a split suction template foundation design and how that could be utilized with some of the installation assets that can be commonly available within that uh, region locally. I'll present on the installation strategy associated with that particular concept. I'll finally wrap up with a cost comparison of some of these uh, strategies and compare it with the uh, conventional fixed wind turbine foundation for particular deeper and the larger wind turbine capacities. Here in this chart, you could see the various fixed wind turbine foundations uh, that have been used offshore, and uh, the most common one being the uh, monopile design. Yeah, and uh, fixed offshore wind turbine foundations actually account for more than twenty-five percent of the overall installed costs, uh, and uh, over the years, uh, as the fixed wind turbine foundations extended into deeper water depths and also in taking on more and more larger wind turbine generator capacities, uh, some of the conventional designs such as three-legged, four-legged jackets and uh, tripods have been deployed. And um, <clears throat> as you can see here, these designs are primarily uh, uh, the conventional uh, fixed wind foundations that are being installed uh, throughout in the in the fixed offshore wind turbine space. As far as the design features are concerned, yeah, and you can see here from this uh, uh, fr from this uh, chart, you know, as we go 
from the fixed wind turbine foundation designer's point of view, the larger the, the turbine generator, yeah, you will see the tower natural system frequencies are uh, going to much lower, right? And therefore, that really uh, dictates uh, how the fixed wind turbine foundation needs to be designed for. And from a wind turbine foundation designer's point of view, there are two things that we typically need to look out for. First is the, the, uh, the blade uh, rotational speed, which is typically represented as P, and the blade passing speed for a typical three blade turbine, uh, the, the blade passing speed will be uh, represented as 3P. Yeah. So uh, from foundation design point of view, we have to avoid the system natural frequencies straddling between this P and 3P to avoid the resonance. And you can see here from the uh, schematic on the bottom right, uh, we have uh, three types of designs. We call it soft, soft design and soft, stiff and stiff, stiff design. A stiff, stiff design, as you can see in the far, uh, far right, has a system natural frequency that is much higher and it will basically be resulting in a much bigger and an uneconomic, uneconomical design of a fixed offshore wind turbine foundation design. Uh, therefore, from a foundation design perspective, uh, the designers will always uh, prefer to have a soft, stiff, uh, stiff design, whereby the system natural frequency will be straddling in between the, the P and 3P, as in the blade uh, rotation speed and the blade passing speed design. That would be the typical uh, wind foundation uh, turbine design uh, preference. <clears throat> So the conventional fixed uh, wind turbine foundations uh, globally have been you know, installed in uh, various footprints uh, depending on the environmental conditions, depending on the uh, uh, water depth and the payload and the turbine generator capacity payload itself. And um, monopiles, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is the most commonly installed uh, uh, fixed offshore wind turbine foundation. And you could see monopile designs of approximately diameters ranging from 10 to 11 meters being installed uh, uh, in water depths of about uh, 30 meters or so. And uh, the foundation uh, is designed to cater up to about uh, five megawatt uh, wind turbine generator capacities. But once we get uh, into slightly deeper water depth, larger payloads, or if the environmental conditions or soil conditions uh, require broader footprint for the designs, that's when the tripods and uh, conventional uh, jacket foundations with uh, driven or suction piles being used. Uh, so you could see some of these designs being used with uh, diameters of, um, as in the footprint could range between 20 to 30 meters footprint on the seabed, and uh, the, the legs diameters could be about uh, two to three meters. Now I move on to some of the conventional fixed foundation design challenges as we try to move it to 10 to uh, 15 megawatt kind of turbine generators. And the first and foremost thing when we are designing these sort of uh, uh, larger uh, foundations to cater to 10 to 15 megawatt uh, turbine generators and deep water depths is the overturning moment. As you can see here in this uh, particular table on the bottom right, uh, if you're looking at a 10 megawatt uh, turbine in uh, say 20 meter water depth versus a 15 megawatt turbine in a 60 meter water depth, the overturning moment is almost three times. So that means that automatically the foundation uh, will need to be much broader and therefore there will be a lot of uh, uh, tonnage to be put into the fixed foundation design. The piles will also need to be equally uh, larger. So we've seen diameters for these piles ranging between two to three meters, probably larger. So this is a unique challenge. So this will sort of uh, compile into requiring much larger hammers to be able to drive these sort of larger diameter piles into, into the seabed. So utilizing larger, diame uh, larger diameter piles and larger hammers uh, comes with its own unique challenges. So one of that is the hammer noise. And it is acknowledged that these hammer noise resulting in pressure wave, shock waves uh, could potentially pose a concern to the aquatic marine life. And uh, uh, various uh, places have their own uh, regulatory requirements for the noise emission. And uh, in Europe specifically, the sound exposure level is limited to uh, 160 decibel with a maximum peak 
limit of 190 decibels at 750 meters. And it varies depending on whether we're looking at in uh, offshore Asia Pacific region or in Australia. But there is a requirement for these sort of uh, noise emission to meet. And uh, the hammer service providers have already been addressing this uh, in various methods by doing pile uh, design optimizations. They are also been looking at from optimizing the RAM weight and also the angle weight. And more so, uh, practically speaking, as we are installing these and driving the piles in, as you can see here from the picture to the right, they use bubble screens to uh, prevent and mitigate these uh, pressure waves you know, on the seabed during the piling operation. Another unique challenge we have in trying to extrapolate and stretch these conventional foundation designs into deeper water depth is actually the, uh, the seismic response. Uh, specific to these kind of fixed offshore wind turbine foundations, they, have, they are very vulnerable for uh, uh, high vertical uh, vibrations during seismic conditions uh, because of the tower uh, natural frequencies in the vertical direction is much, much higher. Yeah, so the, the parameter that is commonly used is called uh, peak ground acceleration in a 500 year return period. So if you look at offshore Europe, the peak ground acceleration for a 500 year uh, return period event is about 5% uh, of G, whereas of uh, Japan, you could see that going all the way up to 40% uh, of G. And uh, <clears throat> another parameter that really works uh, uh, to be a challenge in this sort of seismic response is the uh, how soft the soil characteristics are. Soft soil actually amplifies the pre-ground acceleration by almost two times. So if you look, for example, a fixed film foundation uh, design of in uh, South China Sea with soft soil conditions, you could see the pre-ground acceleration going all the way up to 15% uh, of G. So that is very much unique depending on where you are really looking at these kind of uh, fixed wind turbine foundation applications. Another challenge is uh, the cyclic loading. So these sort of uh, foundation designs are very sensitive to the levelness, very stringent requirement to maintain the levelness to achieve desired uh, wind turbine uh, performance, right? So uh, any cyclic loading could potentially uh, result in some of the soil, uh, soft soil characteristic reaching the, uh, exceeding the pore pressure um, allowable stresses. So it could be due to regular wave flow induced loading, cyclic loading, or it could be due to seismic loading. So that's where uh, there is a distinction between a driven pile foundation and a, and a suction pile foundation comes in place. For a driven pile foundation, um, it's a bit more forgiving in the sense that we could, as a designer, uh, avoid um, um, the, design, uh, the, uh, the driven pile setting depth such that we could uh, mitigate the layer that is prone to this sort of, uh, you know, exceeding the, uh, the pore pressure uh, stress limits. Whereas the suction pile designs tend to be typically shallow set, larger diameter foundations, and therefore, uh, this challenge is more uh, predominant in that part of uh, that type of uh, solution. Now I move on to now some of the cost optimization strategies. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know this is uh, something that has been uh, deployed quite successfully uh, in multiple wind farm projects around the world. And uh, the the basic premise is that you decouple the uh, installation uh, spread, the marine spread and the assets. So you keep the, the heavy lift vessels um, that are used for uh, transporting and installing the, uh, the wind turbine generators with longer uh, crane boom reach, uh, decoupled from the uh, fit for purpose spec uh, crane lift vessels to install the foundation piles and the jacket foundation itself. So the strategy will be such that you will be transporting the structures, which would be uh, the piles and the pre-piling template as part of uh, one dedicated campaign that will allow you to batch set all of these pre-driven piles and followed by another dedicated campaign with a fit for purpose uh, lift barge with sufficient lift capacity to install the jacket foundations and then 
and establish the connection between the pre-installed piles and the jacket foundation. And later, uh, followed by a dedicated heavy lift vessel uh, that is customable for this sort of wind turbine uh, generator installations. So I move into the uh, sequence of uh, such installation strategies. So the first uh, um, stage is to install the pre the, the pre-piling template. So this particular campaign will involve uh, transportation of the pre-piling template and the piles. So your marine spread will include uh, a fit for purpose crane barge that has got sufficient lift capacity to lift and install this sort of uh, uh, pre-piling template and the piles. And you will also require the hammer spread and an ROV that is capable of operating the uh, hydraulic jacks that are pre-built onto the, uh, the pre-piling template. So once the um, crane barge uh, lifts and installs the suction pile, uh, the pre-piling template, sorry, uh, you will proceed to install the piles uh, through the uh, pre-piling template. These pre-piling templates will uh, typically involve um, uh, custom inbuilt uh, leveling instruments as well as uh, hydraulic jacks that allows you to monitor the le levelness of these uh, piling template due throughout the piling operation. So ROV will be utilized to monitor the, the leveling operation and, uh, and it also enables you to space out your uh, piles at appropriate spacing and uh, the leveling so that subsequently when we install the uh, the jackets in the next batch of camping uh, where the jacket will be transported to the site on dedicated uh, cargo barge or on a batch transported using the crane uh, vessels itself uh, you, will, you will be able to achieve the desired uh, levelness of this jacket foundation so in this particular stage, the jacket will be lifted and installed using the fit for purpose crane barge and the uh, jackets will come up with a stabbing, pile, a stabbing pin that will be slotted into the pre-installed piles and the connection will be via high strength grout uh, pumped into the annulus between the sleeve of the jacket pin as well as the, the pile itself. So here is a, a storyboard of uh, various type of heavy lift vessels that are conventionally being used for lifting and installing the, 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 the tower itself. So the, uh, this requires um, a longer uh, crane boom reach and sufficient capacity to be able to lift the, uh, the wind turbine generator to the desired elevation above the seabed and be able to install. So this strategy is totally decoupling uh, such uh, customable high spec HLVs from doing the, the pre-installation of the piles and the jacket foundations. So in essence, this kind of gives us a better means of going with uh, lowest installed cost based on conventional foundation space, which we have currently been working on. And the next uh, uh, optimization that we are considering is to uh, utilize group pile foundation design. So these kind of group pile foundations have been quite successfully been used in uh, oil and gas industry space. So the fixed jacket platforms in oil and gas industry with a heavier uh, topside payload um, usually uh, considers uh, a, a group of two or three uh, piles with smaller diameter piles uh, per leg. And this will uh, be typically uh, a 36 inch uh, or a 42 inch conduct uh, piles, or it could go up to 48 inch piles. So this allows us uh, in terms of better pile fabrication, uh, better uh, pile handling both at the yard as well as offshore. And more importantly, it allows us to choose uh, lower hammer energy settings. And that means lower hammer noise while we are doing the piling operations offshore. Another unique thing about this particular sort of uh, uh, methodology is that it allows you to either um, install the piles in a conventional manner along with a jacket installation or you could have a custom built pre-piling template that allows you to do the installation like in the previous uh, scheme that we have shown. So you could batch install these pre-piling templates with uh, an integral uh, docking cone and later the jacket could be installed on top of it. 
moving on to the other uh, strategy is to use two commonly used uh, technology, very, uh, very much field proven uh, technologies. One is the monopod, another one is the suction can designs. So the, can, the current um, trend we have seen is that there are uh, three-legged or four-legged jacket designs that are integrated to the suction, uh, suction cans and to the, as the foundation. And it is lifted together as a single uh, integrated unit of show. But when we are looking at a larger uh, wind turbine generators, like say 10, 15 megawatt, the wind turbine generator payloads are much, much higher. You are looking at uh, 1,200 all the way up to 2,000 metric ton capacities and the rotor diameter heights are much higher. And therefore, that requires a larger footprint and much uh, larger jacket structure. And it sort of, uh, if we go with the integrated um, jacket structure with a uh, suction can foundation means that we need, we are putting uh, uh, significantly larger uh, lifting capacities for offshore cranage, yeah, which we at the current moment we uh, will pose a challenge in terms of availability of such crane vessels. So therefore, we're uh, looking at the possibility of splitting the foundation design separate from the uh, the structure that is going to be between above the seabed to the water level. To, uh, as an interface to the connection to the tower. So we're specifically looking at uh, designs where uh, you're looking at 10 to 15 megawatt capacities in water depths beyond 30 meters. So the suction can designs could be between nine to 10 meter diameters, 20 to 25 meters uh, long. And uh, the monopods again, you know, could vary between 10 to 11 meter diameters, well within the current uh, fabrication uh, capabilities around um, the, the major uh, wind farm development areas around the world. In terms of fabrication uh, and material procurement, this is a very uh, unique uh, method of uh, minimizing your challenge in terms of material procurement as well as fabrication because uh, fabricating a simpler um, monopod structure is uh, a lot more uh, manageable compared to a um, complex uh, jacket structure to be fabricated. <clears throat> in terms of installation strategy, you're looking at uh, typically four stages whereby you transport your suction can template design, right, using um, anchor handlers that will be commonly available in the in the region. And for this, you will need to have a, a dry dock space whereby you could have this uh, suction can template fabricated and towed to the location and uh, followed by uh, the anchor handlers and the, and the fit for purpose uh, crane barge uh, positioning this uh, template at the location and uh, you know, lowering and installing it. Then subsequently, the same uh, crane barge is utilized to install the monopod design appended offshore and uh, slotted into this pre-installed foundation, followed by uh, establishing a connection between the uh, monopod foundation to the suction can foundation design. So if you look at it in terms of steps, what you look here is a, a suction can design, which is typically uh, floated off by means of uh, sponsons. Yeah, so if it's you're looking at the fabrication uh, at the dry dock uh, capability where you will float off, suction can, the sponsons could be aired up uh, to be able to uh, wet tow this suction can template uh, to the site. So use the anchor handlers uh, in the arrangement, such as this one shown in this uh, schematic, uh, to do a wet tow. You're looking at fairly um, 10 to 15 meter sort of uh, draft restrictions in terms of the key site requiring for this sort of uh, strategy to work. Once the section can template arrives at uh, the location, uh, you will have to rearrange and reposition your anchor handlers in such a way that um, you can commence uh, uh, flooding operation of these uh, sponsons uh, to achieve just uh, sufficient negative buoyancy. And you use the anchor handler winches itself to lower the uh, suction can template towards the seabed. So you could potentially use a crane barge also, uh, if required, depending on the operations, to uh, operate the ROV for suction pump operations. and uh, align the 
align and orientate the suction can template design on the seabed, right? So you will require in this particular case uh, anchor handlers and the sponsons will be removed once you have achieved uh, uh, embedment of the suction can on the seabed and the sponsons could potentially be reused for the subsequent suction can templates. And the um, once we achieve the uh, desired levelness of the suction can template on the seabed, you can proceed to installing the monopod using the same crane barge that will be available at site. You append it off uh, a crane barge or you could be having it transported on, on the uh, heavy lift transportation vessel itself. You append it and you slot it onto the pre-installed uh, suction can template uh, foundation that is on the seabed. Now, as far as the connection is concerned, uh, this could potentially be via high strength grouting uh, material or using mechanical connections which will require uh, diver operations for mechanical connections. So <clears throat> this is in a way a, a methodology that uh, sort of marries two uh, well established uh, um, um, sort of technology that have been installed, that have been utilized offshore uh, fixed fan turbine foundation space. Moving on to the uh, cost comparison. <clears throat> so for this cost comparison exercise, uh, what we have looked at is uh, a, a 10 megawatt uh, wind turbine kind of payload requirement in uh, roughly 40 meters uh, water depth. And uh, we've also looked at uh, the comparison of both uh, the pre-installed piles and group piles against the uh, conventional fixed uh, uh, wind turbine foundation design where it will be a through leg uh, piling uh, versus the uh, monopod and suction can designs. So uh, the spread costing is also on the basis of uh, prevailing market rates for the anchor handlers, uh, HLVs as well as the ROV and other back tech spread available in the Asia Pacific region. That is how we have taken on board in this cost comparison exercise. As you can see here for the uh, pre-installed piles and the group piles uh, design, um, the majority of the, um, uh, the benefit, cost benefit, it comes from the transportation installation phase, not so much in the EPC phase of the, of the fixed wind turbine foundation. So overall, you could basically be looking at uh, anywhere between 7 to 10% of improvement in terms of the overall install cost per platform foundation. Uh, but when it comes to the, uh, the monopod uh, with the suction can designs, right, you see the cost benefit throughout from material procurement to fabrication all the way through to the transportation installation. So where does it come from the material procurement phase is that the monopod itself is a fairly robust design that could cater to larger uh, wind turbine generators and in deeper water depths provided we have sufficient stiffness closer towards the seabed. So, and it is also relatively easier uh, fabrication methodology, simpler fabrication methodology compared to a, an equivalent uh, a jacket uh, uh, platform uh, type of uh, design. And uh, transportation installation, as you have uh, seen in the uh, past couple of slides, where we presented utilizing commonly available uh, anchor handlers uh, to tow from the key side uh, through to the site. So, you're effectively using a very low spec barge uh, at site to be able to align and do the uh, suction can template installation operation. And you will have a custom fit for purpose barge to be able to uh, lift and install the monopods. So that way, that way we are actually um, reducing the TNI spread cost quite significantly. So as a result, this particular uh, design can offer a benefit of about overall 25 to 30% on the uh, overall install cost. <clears throat> so now moving on to concluding remarks, um, we have seen the growing trend of uh, requiring fixed fin foundations to be able to cater to uh, larger 10 to 15 megawatt kind of wind turbine generator capacities. And we are stretching into deeper water depths and uh, stretching the existing conventional uh, fixed offshore wind turbine foundation into these requirements does pose a uh, challenge in terms of design, uh, fabrication, as well as installation operations. 
and therefore we have looked at uh, various cost optimization strategies um, the prevailing um, uh, you know market conditions have already quite uh, very well implemented pre-install pile uh, concepts and the uh, that has delivered um, cost optimization and uh, we've also looked at a possibility of bringing on group by concept which is drawing parallel from the oil and gas industry uh, into the renewable industry space and also the last one being the split monopod and the suction can design which is um, pretty much a, a, a good combination of proven technologies across now um, in terms of which would be the most optimal uh, foundation design uh, is something that needs to be assessed on a site-specific condition basis. Depends on the environment, depends on the soil condition at that location, uh, water depth, as well as the, the wind turbine payloads that we are looking at. So with that, I conclude my um, talk. Thank you, Shri. That was awesome. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions, so we'll just jump right in. Um, the first question was, is there a preferred type of foundation, jacket or monopile, as regards to earthquake and soft soil conditions and design optimization? If you, that's a, that's a good question. It's uh, very much uh, dependent upon uh, uh, water depth and also the, the wind turbine generator. If you're looking at, say, up to 30 meters and uh, five, me five megawatt kind of capacities, you'd probably be looking at uh, monopile design itself which is fairly robust solution. And for uh, deeper water depths in that kind of soft soil and, uh, and uh, seismically prone uh, region, um, the driven pile foundations uh, certainly tend to fare much better because of the inherent uh, uh, challenge of uh, designing a, sh a shallow set foundation, larger diameter shallow set second pile foundation designs. So pre-install, uh, larger diameter piles or group pile design with a fixed wind foundation and uh, jacket designs uh, certainly will um, will will be a good candidate for that application. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question: Is the piling template piled to the seabed, and if not, what keeps the template secure during piling? The piling template um, will have a, a mud mat foundation. So the mud mat will be designed uh, such that it can cater to the, uh, the piling template on bottom stability. So it also uh, takes into consideration uh, the pile leaning loads uh, during the stabbing process, as well as after we land the hammer onto the pile when we are about to set the piles into position. So if there is any leaning loads so all of this is taken into account for the, the pile pre-piling template uh, foundation itself. So it will not be uh, permanent there. So once a piling is completed, um, the prior pre-piling template main uh, objective is to ensure uh, levelness and uh, the pile spacing. And after that, the pre-piling template will be removed and position repositioned to another uh, location to continue the batch piling operation. Okay, um, next question. What is it, sorry, what is the economic water depth limit for fixed offshore wind? And at what water depth does floating wind become more economical? At this moment in time, uh, if we really look at trying to keep it to conventional proven designs, we're looking at rough, uh, anywhere between 50 to 60 meters being the most optimal sort of boundary. But once you look at some of these uh, developments that are coming in place in terms of uh, monopile foundation, there are uh, some additional uh, works uh, in, uh, from the monopile designers in terms of stiffening it up and the pile optimization is being looked at. So that is still uh, a possibility in trying to stretch into deeper water depths. Uh, but anything beyond 60, 70 meters uh, is certainly looking more, uh, more like a, a floating uh, wind foundation uh, design. Okay, um, next question. For the T&I cost analysis, have comparisons been made between the national fabrication yards and international fabrication yards? Oh, well, um, it's a good question. We've 
uh, for that particular cost comparison exercise, uh, we've uh, taken uh, sort of an average um, fabrication uh, rates uh, across Asia Pacific in a more conservative manner. Um, uh, but you're right that you know it's uh, very much a factor that is dependent on where we are going to be fabricating it. Okay, um, next question. What is the minimum soil data necessary for each WTG structure and does it vary for different foundation types? Uh, so minimum there uh, needs to be a soil uh, boring survey uh, to be done with uh, um, CPT test data available and very selective uh, uh, core uh, test samples taken on for various steps and you go through the, uh, the lab test data to correlate with the CPT data. And this uh, CPT data should uh, cover sufficient depth for uh, the complete penetration, uh, target penetration depth that we're looking at. So for a driven pile foundations, you are probably looking at setting depths of about 50 to 70 meters or probably uh, up to 80 meters uh, depth below seabed. So the soil data uh, captured um, will remain pretty much uh, the same requirement across uh, various fixed uh, offshore wind turbine foundation designs, uh, but should have sufficient depth coverage to cater to that um, pile setting depths. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Could you tell us whether the cost comparison presented is applicable for global wind energy markets? Um, I would say that it is applicable in terms of uh, uh, quantum uh, because we have presented that uh, as, a, as more as a percentage improvement. So definitely, if you're looking at um, you know, offshore Europe, uh, some of the uh, percentages may vary depending on the fabrication, prevailing fabrication rates and the, and the vessel and spread rates for the marine uh, operations. Uh, but you certainly can uh, utilize this um, for uh, the, the trend in terms of lower uh, installed costs uh, between conventional foundation versus um, pre-installed piles, group piles, and also the uh, uh, split foundation designs. Okay, next question. Can monopile be used for the deeper water depths and 10 to 15 megawatt WTG capacity? Absolutely, yes. Um, definitely, it's a, a it's a it's a function of uh, environmental data, uh, soil data, and uh, the wind turbine sort of uh, uh, payloads that we expect at that particular site. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, in uh, answer to another question, there there are also um, monopile designers have been working on a lot of pile optimizations and uh, and uh, especially you know strengthening around the seabed uh, where the monopiles are more vulnerable in terms of stresses and fatigue uh, and uh, yes it's a, it's it's a workable design and it needs to be looked at it from a field specific uh, data point of view. Okay. Uh, next question, what are the challenges with grouped pile design solutions? Or well, solutions? Um, as for the group pile uh, designs, you're looking at um, uh, placing the, the piles within close proximity. So therefore, uh, API and other standards require us to consider a loss of uh, um, axial resistance as a factor. So this is called pile group effect. So uh, this requires um, quite in-depth uh, design requirement to ensure that uh, the pile grouping effect is captured um, before uh, maturing the pile uh, spacing as well as pile, uh, pile sizing. Um, but other than that, uh, it does uh, have a lot of proven track record uh, in terms of uh, uh, oil and gas jacket platform with larger payloads and it is a commonly um, employed uh, solution. Okay, thank you. Um, let's do one more question. What are the challenges associated with the split suction can slash monopod solution? <clears throat> okay, this split
split suction can uh, monopod solutions is um, very much dependent on uh, the ability to roll the plates and, and achieve 10 to 11 meter diameter sort of uh, case on uh, fabrication. So that's number one. And number two, we're looking at the way we have presented is to have this fabricated uh, by the key side where there is no severe depth restrictions so that you could float it off and uh, wet dough to the location. So that means that the key side uh, draft requirements uh, are very much uh, a key consideration in choosing this type of uh, design. Uh, for some of the designs we have looked at um, for 40, 50 meters uh, water depth, uh, we're looking at anywhere between 10 to 15 meters sort of uh, depth requirements by the key side to be able to achieve this. So these are the two uh, main criteria that needs to be looked at in choosing the particular design. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Shri, for all the information on the topic. That's all the time that we have for today. But as we mentioned earlier, if we didn't get your question, or if you'd like to continue this discussion, you can contact Shri directly using the details provided here. Thank you to our audience for your time and participation. We hope you all found this useful and will join us for more webinars in this series happening at the end of each month. You can check out the 2H website and LinkedIn for more details and to sign up. Again, please look out for the recording of this webinar in your email in the next 24 hours, and we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.